Next talk is by J.S. LeMay um, from Macquarie University. He's speaking on integrations in a differential category with antiderivatives. Okay, take it away. Yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, differential categories, which having, I'm sure have been talked a lot about in histories of Oktoberfest. So they provide sort of the categorical interpretations of the algebraic foundations of differential calculus. They were introduced by Rick, Robin, and Robert. And then there's lots of uh, concepts that can be formalized in differential categories. And one of these that's particularly nice are the classical notion of derivations in commutative algebra. And there's also been uh, sort of the integration analog of differential categories have also been worked on. And this was worked first worked on by Tamayad and then worked on by myself during my master's thesis with help from Rick and Robin. And so today I'll be talking about the sort of interpreting the integration analog of a derivation, which is an operator which satisfies the Rotor-Baxter rule, which is sort of the analog of the Leibniz rule. And I'll be talking about these things in a differential category with antiderivatives. So I first have to start about, I first have to mention a bit of terminology. So today we'll, we'll actually be talking about co-differential categories, the dual of differential categories. And the reason for this is because differential categories were introduced to provide the categorical semantics of differential linear logic. So that has to do with co-monads and co-algebras. However, co-differential categories capture the notion, uh, capture the notion of algebras and, uh, and the notion of derivation in commutative algebras. So we're going to be working with co-differential categories. However, for people that have never seen co differential categories or co-differential categories before. And whenever I talk about these things, I notice that some people are at first confused about the term co-differential category. So instead, I've been sort of proposing the following note, de, the following alternative terms. So by an algebraic differential category, I mean a co-differential category. And then by a co-algebraic differential category, I just mean a differential category. So today we're going to talk about the first kind, which are algebraic differential categories. Okay, so what is an algebraic differential category? Well, for starters, it's a symmetric monoidal category where um, each hump set is a commutative monoid. So that means I can add maps together and I have zero maps. And the composition and tensor product preserve these things. So the reasons I want the reason I want these things is because if you want to express the Leibniz rule, there's you're going to need to be able to take the sum of things. And then it also comes equipped with something called an algebra modality. Uh, which very briefly is a monad where every free algebra SA comes equipped with a with a natural commutative monoid structure. So I have a multiplication SA tensor SA, and I have a unit uh, to SA, and I have a unit. Now, the rough idea about these algebra modalities is that you should think of SA as sort of the set a set of differential functions in variables of A, and then the monad structure mu and eta correspond to composing these differential functions. And then this extra monoid structure corresponds to multiplying these differentiable functions together. And we'll see in a few slides that one of the canonical examples that you should have in mind are polynomial functions, right? So I can compose polynomial functions together and I can multiply them. I can also multiply them together. And then the thing that makes it a different, an algebraic differential category is that it also comes equipped with a deriving transformation, which is a natural transformation from of type SA to SA tensor A and whose axioms are based on the basic identities from differential calculus. So there's um, there's the constant rule, the product rule, the linear rule, uh, the chain rule, and the interchange rule. So if you so very quickly, uh, here here are those five rules in commutative diagrams. Uh, I'm not going to spend time explaining these things, but the two diagrams that I'd like to sort of point out is the middle one, which is the Leibniz rule. Uh, sorry, the middle, yes, the middle one, which is the Leibniz rule, which tells you how to derive a product. And this bottom left one, which tells you how to derive a composition, which is the chain rule. So these two rules are going to be important in our, in our talk today. So what are some examples? So the first example is the one I sort of hinted at before are polynomials. So let's take the category of vector spaces over a field K. Well, commutative monoids in this category of vector spaces are just commutative algebras. 
So we're going to find an algebra modality sim as follows. So for every vector space v, I'm going to say that sim of v is the free commutative algebra over v, which is also known as the free symmetric algebra. Now, since I have vector spaces, I can just take my basis and then it turn, and then you can just say that the free symmetric algebra is the polynomial ring over the base over my basis set X. So for example, if you take uh, in particular, if you take sort of the k to the n, then the sim of k to the n is just the polynomial ring in n variables. And the algebra modality structure corresponds to composing polynomials together and multiplying them together. And in particular, the deriving transformation can be described in, can be described in terms of polynomials as follows. So I have to go from the polynomial ring to the poly polynomial ring tensor v. So what I do is that I pick up my polynomial and I send it to the sum of its partial derivatives, where you you sort of distinguish each sum end by which variable you're summing over, and that's the v part. But there's not only polynomials that we can, there's not only polynomials, there are other interesting functions that we can differentiate. So in particular, there's also the smooth functions. And the algebra modality that corresponds to the smooth functions one, to the smooth, smooth function model is the one that captures C infinity rings. So very briefly, uh, C infinity ring is a commutative algebra where for each smooth function from Rn to R, there's a function from An to N which satisfies certain coherences. And so the rough idea that I like to have about C infinity rings is that it is that for every smooth function, there's there's a way of evaluating um, that smooth functions with elements of A. So the canonical example that you should have in mind is sort of the if you don't know anything about C infinity rings, that's okay. The only example that you need for today is C infinity of R n, which is uh, just the set of smooth functions from R n to R. Now, for every vector space, there's a free C infinity ring, and I'm going to call this thing S infinity of V. And of course, this induces an algebra modality on VEC, where again, the monad structure is given by composing smooth functions, and the algebra modality structure is given by multiplying smooth functions. In particular, if you take R to the N, then S infinity of N, R to the N, is just C infinity of R to the N. And again, the deriving transformation is captured by taking a smooth function f and then mapping it to the sum of its partial okay, derivative. So yeah, that, that seems good, I mean. Uh, yeah. Hello? OK. Um, OK, so so yeah, so those are our two examples of differential categories. All right, so now we're going to move on to sort of quickly describing derivations in these things. So in classical algebra, derivations are axiomatized by the Leibniz rule, right? Which tells you how to derive the multiplication of two functions. So, so in commutative algebra, the way you capture this is to say that a derivation is a linear map from an algebra A to one of its modules M, such that an, the analog of the Leibniz rule holds. And then when M equals A, uh, a, a special case is the case when an algebra is seen as a module for itself. And then such an algebra with a derivation is called a differential algebra. So in an algebraic differential category, derivations are instead axiomatized by the Leibniz rule because we have access to composing smooth functions, something we don't necessarily have in commutative algebra. And it turns out that from this ax from this axiomatization used in the Leibniz rule, we can also show that they satisfy the sorry from the axiomatization that they satisfy the chain rule. We can also show that they also satisfy the Leibniz rule which means that every one of these derivations in a differential category are actual derivations in the classical sense. But to do that, I first need to tell you, talk about algebras and modules in an algebraic differential category. So we're not just gonna, so obviously we can, algebras can be generalized in a symmetric nodal category, but we want to do better than that. And the way we do that is we take algebras of our monad. So for every algebra modality, every S algebra comes equipped with a commutative monoid structure. And the way you do this is that you use the monoid structure that comes from the algebra modality. And you'll notice that if you apply these constructions for free S algebras, you get back precisely the, the natural multiplication and natural unit of the algebra modality. 
And then for a, and then what do we do for our, what do we take as our modules? Well, our, your modules, you're just going to take the, nat, the, the basic thing of the basic notion of modules over a commutative monoid. So for example, the sim algebras correspond precisely to commutative algebras. And the way you're supposed, and one way to see this is that um, the sim algebra structure of a commutative algebra is captured by the fact that because I have an algebra A, I can evaluate, I can take a polynomial and sort of evaluate that polynomial with elements of A by multiplying things together. And same sort of, same sort of idea for S infinity algebras. These are precisely the C infinity rings where the monad where the the monad algebra structure is given by the fact that I can evaluate smooth functions with elements of A. So a derivation in a differential category. So for an S algebra A with a module M, an S derivation is a map which satisfies the following diagram. And if you read this diagram, what it's saying is that if you see the S algebra structure sort of as evaluation or composition, then this diagram is just capturing the is just capturing a version of the chain rule. And these things were described by uh, Blue, Lucius, and Wright and O'Neill in this paper, Derivations in a Differential Category. And as I mentioned, one of the main things is that we can actually show that this satisfies the Leibniz rule. So the, the rule here, on, the little triangle here on the left is saying that when you derive a constant, you get zero. So this is a rule that we get for free when we have negatives, but because I didn't assume that my differential category necessarily had negatives, then we have to prove it manually. And then this rule, this square on the on the right is indeed the Leibniz rule. So, so S derivations are indeed derivations. Now, uh, before I just show examples, uh, one of the famous examples of derivations in algebras are Taylor differentials. And these are still, and we can still capture these things in a differential category. So for a free S algebra, SA, uh, SA tensor A is an SA module where you just, where the module action is just given by multiplication. And it turns out that the deriving transformation is indeed an S derivation, thanks to one of its axioms. And furthermore, it is universal. So for every other derivation on S of A, I can sort of fill up, uh, there is a free, there is a SA module map from SA tensor A to M. And this captures the notion of Kähler differentials for S of A, in a sense. And if we have enough co-equalizers, then we can do this for any S algebra. OK, so what are our derivation examples? So what are the sim derivations? Well, very easily, the sim derivations are just precisely classical derivations. So um, the reason why this is true is that even though derivations are only axiomatized by the Leibniz rule, we still get a chain rule th with respect to polynomials because, right, polynomials are just given by multiplication. And if you want a chain rule of a poly, and then if you take the derivative of a polynomial evaluated at elements of A, you can just use the Leibniz rule to obtain the chain rule, to obtain the sim derivation chain rule that you want. For C, for C infinity rings, uh, the S infinity derivations correspond to these things uh, that were defined by Dubuque and Koch, um, which are derivations for for mass theory, which are called C infinity derivations. And these are derivations that satisfy that when you evaluate smooth functions at elements of A, then they satisfy this this chain rule, this chain rule axiom that you're uh, that you're expecting. And one way to see that C infinity derivations are the same thing are indeed derivations is that you can just you can take this for the smooth function uh, given by multiplication. OK, so now for, for the second half of my talk, let's now move to the new part, which are integrations. So these are probably less well known. So uh, in classical algebra, an integration is axiomatized by something that's called the Rotobaxter rule which is an integral only version of the integration by parts rule, right? So the integration by parts rule that we learn in calculus involves both the integral and the differential. And this is something that I don't necessarily want when if I want to axiomatize integration on its own. So what you can do is that you can take little f to be the integral of capital F and little d to be the capital big G, and then playing around with the fundamental theorems of calculus, you get this formula here that only involves integrals. 
And this is called the Rotobaxter rule. So if there's one thing to take away from my talk, if you've never seen this before, this is it. Um, I quite like these things. Rick introduced them to me way back when I was an undergrad student, and I've been playing with Rotobaxter rules and Rotobaxter algebras ever since. So an integration now goes in the opposite direction. It goes from a module M to an algebra A, such that the Rotobaxter rule holds. And in the special case that M equals A, so an algebra, um, algebra is seen as a module over itself, if it comes equipped with an integration, it is called a Rotobaxter algebra. Now, in, as I'll explain in a few slides, in a differential category, integrations are instead going to be axiomatized by integration by substitution rule, which is the integral analog of the chain rule. And I'll be able to show that these things that these things that satisfy this axiom also satisfy the Rotobaxter rule, and therefore are classical, are indeed classical integrate or indeed are indeed integrations in the classical sense. But a natural question to ask is, well, the first thing I, I can say is that we can already define an integration, what an integration would be in a differential category. But an obvious question that you one should have is, why talk about integrations in a differential category and not about integrations in an integral category, right? Thing I worked on in my master's thesis. Well, very briefly, an integral category instead comes equipped with an integral transformation, which is a natural transformation this time going from SA tensor A to S of A. So why don't I talk about integrations interacting with this little integral transformation, little s? There seems to be a blue line that has appeared on my slide from somebody. Um, well, the answer is because little s, unfortunately, doesn't have a composition axiom. It doesn't have an integral version of the chain rule. The reason for this is, very briefly, there is no integral-only version of the integration by substitution rule. Um, because the integral ver the integral only version of this rule does not hold in the multivariable case. And I'll explain a bit more about this in a second. So an integration in a differential category will satisfy the an analog of the integration by substitution rule, and it'll involve both integration and differentiation. But before we do that, let's quickly talk about antiderivatives in a differential category. So in any differential category, um, you can define this natural transformation L from SA to SA. And what you do is that you derive, and then you get SA tensor A, and then you're going to multiply back in that A part to get L. And then we'll say that a differential category has antiderivatives if the natural transformation K, which is defined at L plus S of zero, is a natural isomorphism. So you might be wondering, well, why didn't you just ask that L was an isomorphism? Well, L is not going, never going to be an isomorphism because it's always going to kill off the constant parts. So that's what that S of zero is doing here. The S of zero is sort of saving the constant parts that, that are killed off by L. And the reason we call this having antiderivatives is because from this K inverse, we can actually define an integral transformation. So we can actually define an integration. And the way that you do this is that you start off from SA tensor A, multiply in the A part, and then do k inverse. And the rough idea is that you sort of you take a smooth function and you take your variable and then you take and then you send it to the integral of that smooth function at that variable x. And this, what we call the antiderivative ant integral transformation, satisfies the Rotobaxter rule and the fundamental theorems of calculus and all these good things. More about this in a second. So very quickly, what are the examples? So in the polynomial model, uh, capital K is going to take a monomial and send that monomial to uh, itself multiplied by its degree. And by, what I mean by its degree is that it's the sum of degrees of all the variables. And then it's going to send constants to constants. Then this, this is indeed an isomorphism if K, K is a field of characteristics like zero, because then you just take K inverse to be one over the sum of the degrees and then send constants to constants. And then what you get for the antiderivative integral transformation is that you take a monomial, tensor the variable, and you send it to one over the full sum plus one. And you might be thinking, well, that's quite strange. 
shouldn't, when you take the integration, shouldn't you only be integrating over that specific variable? And the answer is, well, unfortunately, that doesn't work for the notion of an integral category. But this formula is indeed something does indeed work because it actually turns out to be precisely the line integral that we see in multivariable calculus applied to a polynomial function. But of course, we can take things that aren't just line integral. We can take the line integral of things that aren't just polynomials. We can also take the line integral of just smooth functions. So, so the smooth function example also has antiderivatives. So the formulas for k and k inverse are a bit complicated, so I won't spend too much time on it. But the important thing is that the antiderivative integral transformation is quite is actually quite nice and something that we all know it is indeed the line integral. So you take a smooth function and then you take your variable x, and then you take the inter the line integral of f. Just take the line integral of f at that variable x i. And again, if you take a polynomial, if you take f to be a polynomial function, then you get back the integral formula that I had on the previous slide. Okay, so now we want to define S integrations, which is now, which recall is going to be whose axioms are an analog of integration by substitution rule. And what I really want is I really want that the antiderivative integral transformation all be an S integration. Okay, so here's our first attempt. So I'm going to say that if I have my S algebra A and I have my module M, then an S integration goes from M to A such that, well, as I mentioned, one's first attempt might be to try and do an integration by substitution rule using only integrals. And this isn't, and using the fundamental theorems of calculus, then this is something that you can work out. But as I've already told you, this unfortunately doesn't work. But just for fun, let's just try and translate this thing out in a, in a differential category. And what you get is that this following diagram would commute, which is a very nice diagram. And it's very pleasing to the eyes and all that good stuff. But unfortunately, um, there's a pro there are two problems with the definition. The first one is that the integral transformation does not satisfy this diagram, right? This is the, if it did, then that would be the sort of missing composition axiom that I didn't have, that I mentioned that I did not have for my integral transformation. The other quote unquote problem is that this this definition this diagram assumes that I have antiderivatives for our definition, and what I want to do is define integrations in a differential category only, where I didn't necessarily need to assume antiderivatives. Okay, so what it, what is the proper attempt? Well, here's the correct attempt. So instead, because I'm allowing myself to use both integrals and differentials in my axiom, if you play around with the fundamental theorems of calculus enough, then you get this formula for the integration by substitution rule. And then you're going to ask that an S integration be a map P such that uh, this equality holds. So the part about, so if you read out this equality, this says that when you take a smooth function F and then evaluate it at an integral, you get, well, you get the first part of that sum and above, which is that comp which is this complicated formula here, plus, that extra constant rule. So that extra constant rule, that sorry, that plus that extra constant part, and that extra constant part is there to uh, is there to deal with again the constant terms or the constant functions. So what's nice about this is that this is a definition that works in any differential category. So um, so first of all, every S integration satisfies the Rotor-Baxter identity. So S integrations are indeed integrations. And moreover, um, if I did have antiderivatives, then not all, then I can re then I could re-express the S integrate S integration axiom as one big commutative diagram, where this time it's that square that didn't commute, but on this side I added S and the differential, and with S and little d, it makes this this the antideriv antiderivative integral transformation does satisfy this diagram and is therefore an S integration. OK, so very quickly to start wrapping things up, what are some examples? So the reason I wanted uh, integration, S integrations to be defined in any differential category is because I wanted to recapture the fact that if I take sim integrations, I get back classical integrations for, for any field k. 
And the answer is it's true. So um, why is so in one direction we've already seen it? Why is it true in the other direction? Well, it turns out that the sim integration axiom is just telling you it's just essentially just a higher order Rotobaxter rule, which you can prove for when you evaluate polynomials at uh, sort of the at a bunch of p of n's. And then for C infinity rings, an, an S infinity integration is a map that satisfies this axiom down below with respect to smooth functions. And I've never seen these before, but essentially these are just maps that satisfy integrations by substitution with respect to those smooth functions Rn's. Okay, so these are my very last slides. So how should derivations and integrations interact? Well, they should be compatible via the fundamental theorems of calculus. So the second fundamental theorem of calculus, I'll start with the second one, uh, states that when you take the integral of the derivative, you just you get um, you get the function, you get the upper bound minus the lower bound. Um, now, the reason I take zero here is that the only lower bound that I'm guaranteed to have in a differential category is the zero map, right? Because is evaluating at zero because I always have it. So, um, so how do I capture this sort of evaluating a constant map? Well, we need an evaluation map, and this is just captured by an idempotent S algebra morphism from A to A. In particular, for the free S, for the free S algebras, uh, evaluating at zero is captured by S of zero, and it turns out that I can just say that a derivation and an integration satisfy the fundamental theorems of calculus at an evaluation E if, well, these first two axioms, which says that if you derive an E and if you inter you get zero, and if you take the integral in an E, you get zero, just says that if you derive a constant, you get zero, and if you evaluate an integral at the lower bound, you also get zero. And this last and this third identity here on the right is just saying that you have the second fundamental theorem of calculus, which says that if you integrate, if you differentiate and integrate, you essentially get the identity up to a constant. And the driving transformation and integral transformation do indeed satisfy FT, FT, FTC2 together at S of, at S of zero. Um, so I'm running out of towns, time, so, I, so here's the other part, fundamental theorem which should say that if you derive and if you integrate then derive, you should get back to where you started. Unfortunately, uh, the deriving transformation and the integral transformation do not satisfy FTC1. And the reason for that is that while it does hold in the one variable case, it doesn't hold in the multivariable case. However, I would still very much like to have a sort of integration of derivation on my free S algebras A, which satisfy both FTC1 and FTC2. And the answer to this is having these things, is having what I call split antiderivatives. So I assume that I have antideriv split antiderivatives if um, this idempotent, uh, K inverse L, splits, and it's going to split through this thing gamma, which is equivalent to asking that the idempotent, uh, S followed by D, which remember is not the identity, splits. So you can think about gamma a as sort of being the image of the of the derivative, sort of the image of little d. And so here's my very here's my very last slide, or here's the last slide that I'm going to talk about today, is that if I have split antiderivatives, then gamma a becomes an S a module, <clears throat> and then I can use capital L to build an S derivation on gamma, and I can use k inverse to build an S integration on gamma. And then these, this derivation and this integration will satisfy both FTC1 and FTC2, which sort of improves upon, depending on your point of view, on the antiderivative integral transformation. And the reason that I've added these two, in, that I meant, wanted to mention that also these two following diagrams also commute, is that if you wanted to go the other direction, if you wanted to assume that I had a module that satisfied that had derivation and integration that satisfied FTC1 and FTC2, then I, as far as I, as far as I can tell, I would also need these two diagrams to commute. I'm trying really hard to show that I don't need these things, but so far that's the best I can do. And then from these things, I can show that I that I that I have split antiderivatives 
And not only that, that the antiderivative integral transformation factors through gamma A. Um, and then of course, so you know what? I'm out of time. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for listening and happy Halloween and merci. Thank you, JS, and let's thank JS with our virtual uh, applause. And are there questions, comments for JS? Well, if nobody else is going to ask a question, I will ask a question. Oh, um, no. You, you actually, I thought you mentioned polynomial functors in your uh, mm. talk. No. No, you didn't. I did not. <laughs> well, I could still ask. I mean, you can differentiate these. So uh, can you integrate, do you think? Have you? <clears throat> so... I think that some people have looked into integration of polynomial functors, but um, I know that I know that there are some sort of two categorical models of polynomial or uh, of species in the Joyal and his collaborator sense that I think you can differentiate and integrate, but I've never seen the notion of integrating polynomial functors, so I don't know. I okay. don't know because you need right. You need to you need to like for example divide by n. I don't know that if you you can not, I don't know if you can divide by n in the polynomial functor model. Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. And what about the relation of what you're doing now to <coughs> integration in tangent categories? So, so this is something. So this is um, right. So derivations in differential geometry, derivations correspond to vector fields. So there's a very nice link to derivations in a tangent categories to, sorry, derivations in a differential category to vector fields in a tangent category. What I would like to know is if there's, what do integrations from either algebra or just differential category correspond to in tangent categories? And the short answer is, I don't know. So if anybody has any thoughts about that, because I've never seen the Rotor-Baxter rule used anywhere in differential geometry, um, but it should be very much linked uh, because these S-algebras form a, form a tangent category. So in theory, there's hopefully there is a link about what integrations are in a tangent category, but I don't have a answer because I don't know what Rotor-Baxter, what integrations that satisfy the Rotor-Baxter rule are in differential geometry. Okay, thank you. 